Okay, thanks, thanks all uh, for coming. We are very uh, happy and very proud to present today um, Eberhard Schlag from Atelier Brugner. Um, it's uh, it's uh, really an honor uh, for the school, for Elisabeth, and for the Masters in Ephemeral Architecture and Temporary Spaces, particularly, to uh, to have you here. Uh, just a very quick introduction for those of you who may not, uh, hopefully, few of you who may not be aware of um, Atelier Brugner uh, and never uh, never had uh, Schlag. Um, Eberhard uh, has been a partner of Atelier Brugner since 2008, where he's responsible for the development and implementation of a large number of national and international projects for brands and museums. He studied architecture at the University of Stuttgart and uh, uh, the master's program at the IIT in Chicago. Since 2010, he's been professor of architecture and design at the University of Applied Sciences in Konstanz and has built up an interdisciplinary master's program in cooperation with the departments of computer science and history uh, of the University of Konstanz uh, and uh, music design of the State University of Munich in Trossignon. In 2018, he founded Atelier Brugner Korea in Seoul, in Seoul. Um, and uh, well, basically, uh, he's here uh, to talk about, um, I guess, these uh, two uh, profiles that he has, the professional uh, in Atelier Brugner, uh, as a partner of Atelier Brugner, sorry, and uh, the, uh, the uh, educational uh, in Constance. Um, Atelier Brugner is possibly one of the, if not the most important uh, or relevant uh, uh, firm dealing with uh, mm, uh, museums and exhibitions, exhibition design basically. Uh, uh, they have an international practice based in Stuttgart and their work ranges from very small artistic projects to large scale museums such as the Grand Egyptian Museum in Cairo, uh, for instance, quite recently. So thanks a lot, uh, Ebrard, for uh, being here, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Roger, for this nice uh, invitation. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here today in, in Barcelona and speak about our uh, work. And as already mentioned, I would like to talk about both aspects of, of my work. Um, the work at Atelier Brückner, but also uh, about some of um, our student works that we do in, in Constance. Yeah, I will quickly introduce the office for those who do not know Atelier Brückner. Um, yeah, we are quite a l large office, um, but this is a view into our workspaces. We work quite um, classical, so you see lots of models, you see walls where we visualize uh, our ideas and our concepts, so we, we strongly believe in, in the physicality of uh, our work. Of course, we do everything with computers and in 3D, but we strongly believe in this uh, physical uh, work environment, and I think this is probably not so uh, much different from your workspaces at the university. We're working in different fields, so we start from architecture, um, but um, most of uh, you will know our exhibition work that ranges from all fields of exhibition. Uh, we design centers, visitor centers for large institutions. We work for different target groups. Children is one of our um, biggest target group. We did expo pavilions on almost all of the large uh, world expos since 2000. Uh, we're doing interior architecture. This is the German Stock Exchange, for example, in Frankfurt. And uh, just recently, we also do a lot of refurbishment of uh, historic buildings. And I think this is also a very interesting aspect. Um, and I would like to introduce also one of these projects today. Um, this is where I'm coming from. It's uh, Stuttgart, and this is our office. So it's um, a comparable small city, 600,000 inhabitants, and uh, we, we're using this old um, workshop um, building. And uh, what's typical about Stuttgart is that we have wine in, in the city, we have forests, and it's kind of a hilly landscape, um, but a very good working atmosphere. Uh, we have um, a lot of car industry, so it's a wealthy uh, city, um, and I don't know why, but um, it became one of the hotspots um, of 
interior design and scenography. There's not only our office, but also many other offices located in the area. So there's a kind of uh, good exchange of, of, of people and ideas and, and systems. Yeah, um, as already mentioned, we are a quite a big office. We have 108 people working in, in Stuttgart. Um, and what's special about our um, office is that we don't have architects and interior architects, but we have people from 11 disciplines uh, working in the office. And they jointly work together uh, to, uh, to really be able to deal with these complex projects we're working on. And something else we're very proud of is that people are coming from 22 nations. I just learned today that People from almost the same amount of nations are studying here at Elisava. And uh, of course, this is also very important because we're doing projects all over the world. And if you do a project in the Arabian region or in Asia, you can't do those projects without having people from that uh, culture uh, to get an understanding of the special task of the project. Yeah, we are a large team. This is uh, on our regular field trips that we're doing in one of our projects, the National Park um, in Berchtesgaden, where we did the visitor center. And I always like to stress that we are a, a big team because without this um, amazing team, it wouldn't be possible for us to do all these projects that we have been working during the past 20 years. Um, we started from Germany, then um, worked our way through Europe, but mainly we are doing projects in the Arabian region and in Asia. And the difference in, th in this region is that there are still large museum projects um, ongoing, whereas in Europe um, the economy is slowing down and there are not so many projects going on. This is also the reason why we opened up um, Atelier Brückner in South uh, Korea in this nice building. So whenever you come to South Korea, you are invited to, to visit our office, um, as well as you are invited to come to Stuttgart at any time. Um, we have an open house. There's lots of things to see. And um, as I am teaching and Uwe Brückner is also teaching, we are op always open uh, to, for students and their interest. Um, yeah, this is our office in Seoul. There's a tea house on the rooftop, so it's, it's actually a very, very nice workplace in a very nice city. Atelier Brückner is famous for uh, this slogan, Form Follows Content. You probably all know the quote from Louis Sullivan, Form Follows Function. And um, Uwe Brückner changed this to Form Follows Content because in our work, we always start from the content. And I will explain this um, in my lecture a little later. And um, since the form is developing from the content, all the projects look different. We have a kind of a, a mindset that is guiding us through all the projects, but the form, the expression, the design is always different. And also is the scale of our project. Um, this was just mentioned, it's the Grand Egyptian Museum in, in Cairo. This is the largest project we're working on. It's a 100,000 square meter um, complex, 30,000 square meter of exhibition space, so one of the largest museums in the world that we are working on. But we also do projects like this. This is one of our smaller projects. Um, it's just a little tiny market stand in the zoo of Heidelberg where children can learn about um, the animals of the zoo. And I'm telling this because um, every pro project, even if, if, if it's small or big, is, has the same importance uh, for our work. And you can see the details that we, or, or even of these small projects, um, they are as important as the details of a super expensive large project somewhere in the world. So I would like to introduce um, some things that are common in, in our work, in all of our projects. And this is that we deal with objects and their history. Or if we, it comes to commercial projects with 
brands and their messages. And this is something that is very, very common for all of our uh, work. And we always work with, with space, of course. All our projects happen in space. And it's all about atmosphere because we believe in the narrative potential of space. So we strongly believe that we can tell stories through space. And to maybe explain this a little better for you, I always start with this um, object, because in many of our projects, um, we have to deal with objects and tell their stories. I don't know, has anyone an idea what this object could be? A watch, yeah, that's correct. And is it a, what kind of watch could it be? Wristwatch, yeah? And how does it look? Old, rusted, yeah? So it, it seems it... Underwater, maybe? Maybe underwater, yeah? This is what... One of the typical answers, because you know that we did the Titanic exhibition, but it's not, it's not um, from the Titanic. Yeah, here you can read the name. It's the watch of Chioko Nakata, <laughs> And it changed its appearance. It, it stopped um, walking on August 6, 1945. So, and now everyone sh uh, understands the story behind this watch. And um, this is kind of an object that we have to deal in our projects almost every day. Um, when you just see it, you know that it's an old watch. When you have the context, you understand the bigger meaning, a bigger story, and this is the story we need to tell in our, in our work. And then, coming to atmosphere. Um, you probably know this space, the Tate Modern in, in London from Herzog and Dumeron. Um, they converted this space into a museum, and this is what Olafur Eliasson, one of my favorite artists, did to that space. Yeah. With one intervention, he completely changed the space into something different. And you will agree that he filled the space with a certain atmosphere and a certain narrative. And this is actually what we believe in, that we can change spaces, we can fill them with atmosphere, and we can tell stories. Second example, you know, you recognize that Eliasson is one of my favorite artists. Um, the Rainbow Panorama. I don't know if you have been there in Aarhus. If you've never seen it, you should go there. It's an amazing space, uh, 360 degree walkway on the top of um, the art museum. And when you walk through this space, the space, the atmosphere is constantly changing. This is the same space. And the only thing he did is that he covered the walkway with um, colored glass that is changing its color according to the rainbow. And during every time of the day, according to the, to the sunlight, um, the space is changing. It's just amazing. So again, it's a space that um, has, has a meaning, and that meaning is created um, through atmosphere. And if I'm coming to our project, this is basically the set that we have in almost every project. We start with an object um, where it can be a museum object or it can be a, a, an object in a commercial project. And we have to tell the story behind at a special location to the visitor, to the audience, to the recipient. And this kind of um, relationship is something that we have to look at um, when we design a project. So we are always in this relation of object and story. So it's about storytelling. And you know there are many ways to tell stories. And we strongly believe in the dramaturgy meaning in a special way of telling the, stor the story um, from, an, from a starting point to a, a defined 
end. And if we look at objects, we just looked at the watch that I have presented you. These objects need a context, so we need to contextualize them to translate their meaning into our time to make them understandable. So it's about giving them back their lost context to recontextualize them. This is how we call it. And now I'm coming to the Titanic. This is, was the initiating project of Atte Brückner in, 19, in 1997. And here I can explain you what we mean with this kind of recontextualizing objects. What you see on this table are kind of super simple objects. These are bottles and vases, kind of like everyday objects. If I would put them here on the table, you would just overlook them. Yeah? They are not special. They are only special because they were on the Titanic, they sunk with the Titanic, and of course they are represent they are representation of all the people and the lives that are lost in the ship. So we need to tell the story in this exhibition um, we developed uh, for, for the findings of the Titanic. And this is how we presented them. You can see that we didn't put them in showcases, but we presented them on tables with a tablecloth like they were presented on, on the Titanic. And of course, there's a glass cover, but it's not about the glass cover. It's about the table and the cloth. And maybe here you can see it even better. Here this, um, this showcase is filled with water and the table with the object is placed on this, in this water-filled showcase. And without any explanation, um, the story of these objects and the, story, the larger story of the ship is being told. Another example, um, this is, these were nails from a Viking ship. Of course, all the wooden parts of the ship, they are disappeared and only the nails remained. And here we have contextualized it in a way that we just presented the nails in a very, very simple way in plastic bags hanging from the ceiling, but, but in their original position so that you could understand the shape of the ship without any explanation. So this is what I mean when I'm talking about contextualizing objects in space telling a larger story through a spatial installation. And oftentimes, we have to deal with books, and books are very difficult to display. This is the pattern book of um, a textile and industry um, museum in Augsburg in Germany. And you always have to make a decision which is the most beautiful page. This is the page you turn off. And then you can look at this single page. And the, all the rest is hidden. And of course, these objects are super precious. They have to be in a showcase, climatized, and super well um, preserved. So what did we do? Um, we designed these large dresses, oversized dresses, and put them in the center space um, of the museum on a catwalk. and put them kind of on stage in a special light setting and projected the patterns of the pattern book onto um, these dresses. So they become visible and accessible again. And we did this with uh, digital media in a very simple way. So the original pattern book became a digital pattern book and the, the visitors could se select the different patterns and project them on uh, the dresses. And they could go even further. They could change um, the designs and create their own designs, which was the basic meaning of these pattern books for uh, the designers of this factory in former times. So with these um, principles, the, these principles of telling stories, of contextualizing things, we start um, developing our projects, and we always work with a set um, of tools that we use in all of our projects. And um, I 
need to be combined to create these immersive atmospheric spaces that are special for our work. And these tools are light, graphics, digital media, um, and sound, and we always question every project. We all, always develop every project with these tools. And um, this is, of course, not our work. It's James Turrell, one of the most famous light designers. Um, and I'm t showing you this image because there you can get an idea of, of the quality and the power um, of light. Light can open spaces. Um, light can even create spaces, um, can fade out dimensions. And um, it's a strong tool in designing spaces that we could make good use of. And I very much like these stage sets of Robert Wilson because uh, they are so simple and so pure and they show the strength and uh, the quality of light. Here he just uses a blue background and one single um, light source. And everyone immediately understands that this is a night um, setting. He creates an endless space by this blue light and with this just one simple, simple symbol, everyone understands it's night. And here, he, he does the exact opposite. He puts red in the background and blue in the foreground, so the picture, the space becomes super flat. Um, it's almost the backlit, backlight uh, situation, so a completely different meaning, completely different setup of the space. And it's only done with light. There's nothing built, nothing constructed, it's only light. So light is really a strong tool um, to, to design spaces to get, to put de a deepness to a space or the exact opposite. And graphic. This is another one of my favorite artists, Barbara Krüger. Uh, you might know her. She's working with, um, mainly only with typography with letters, with words, an exhibition that we did, she did for the Kunsthaus in Bregenz. And so here, the, the whole space, the whole story is just told through typography, through words and letters. And I think, again, this is, a, we know graphic as a, as a tool where we can explain things, where we can read things, but we can do even more. We can um, create spaces only from words and letters. And then, of course, digital media is uh, a very important uh, tool in all of our work. Um, and we often use it to access the inaccessible. Yeah, this is a project uh, we did in Amsterdam, the Maritime Museum. It's an amazing collection of globes. Of course, they are highly um, high they're precious objects, you are not allowed to touch them, they're in climatized showcases. So um, they're beautiful, but in a way they're inaccessible. And of course you want to touch them, you want to rotate them, you want to understand their deeper meaning behind. And here digital media can help us. And when we do, when we introduce digital media, we always try um, to develop interfaces that are closely connected to the object itself. So we're not interested in, in touch screens and things that you have every day, but we're always looking in, sp in special interfaces that have a strong connection um, to the use of these globes. So you can rotate them, you can select different ones, and you get the deeper meaning and understanding. Yeah, and another very important issue that we have to um, look at in museums is Again, if you have very beautiful objects that you can look at, like pieces of art. And if you want to look at pieces of art, you want to see their beauty, their pureness, their richness, and you don't want to have lots of explanation. But on the other hand, if you are not an expert, you don't know the deeper meaning, you don't know the story behind, so you have a, of course you want to know more than just um, looking at the objects. And so we introduce something that we call information on demand. 
that we use in many projects. So there's a second layer in this showcase that can be turned on and turned off by the touch of a button. Um, and there's a projection and the story behind, so you know um, who used these objects, how were they made, and so on and so on. And then you can look at them as pieces of art. That's something that is very important in our work that we um, also believe in the changing of spaces. So every spaces are not static, but spaces um, are, can be performative, they can change over time and we can make good use of that. And yeah, you know this from the poster. Um, this is a project that we did for the Expo uh, in Shanghai, which is maybe the, the most immersive media project we've done. Um, it's for the electrical uh, company of China, the State Grid Corporation. And on a World Expo, you have to tell a story real short, because people go from one pavilion to the other, they see maybe 10 pavilions per day, and they have only a few minutes um, of, of your attention. You have only a few minutes to, uh, um, to tell the story. And this is what we did in this, it's a cube, um, six-sided LEDs, and we're telling the story of energy production and transportation and I'm just showing a short movie clip to give you an uh, idea how far you can go uh, with digital media and, and storytelling. As you can imagine, this is, of course, a very strong tool. You're, you're really dealing with our uh, physicality, um, with our recognition of, of space, and you're changing it. Um, so we did a lot of testing uh, to make the people still feel comfortable um, in such an environment. And now um, we're looking at new tools. Yeah, we're looking at VR, virtual reality. And um, I told you many things about um, designing spaces um, to get people immersed into space and to tell story. And all of a sudden, everything happens in this simple box. Yeah, so the whole um, setup that I just showed you for state grid can happen in, in this single piece, which is super cheap and, and available on the market for everyone. And what, and what does it do with our spaces all of a sudden um, spaces can look like this. You don't have to um, design them anymore because everything is just going on uh, in this single piece. And I don't think so. It's an interesting tool, and, um, but still, if you, if you use VR, and um, this is a project we did uh, at our university um, almost uh, yeah, four years ago, um, it was a project for the State Office uh, for Monument Preservation about uh, ancient lake dwellings at the Lake of Constance. And uh, we did a virtual reconstruction of these dwellings uh, and made them accessible through VR. So people could really walk through these lake dwellings. But of course, we also looked at the space because there's always a moment before um, you wear uh, the VR glasses and after. The setting is um, a lake where people can walk through the lake. There's a projection that is changing. So we think um, even if we use a virtual environment to enlarge the space, um, we need to think about um, 
the physical space as well. And then once you uh, wear the glasses, you can then immerse into um, the environment and, and walk between these lake dwellings. And it, it's a very strong tool also to tell story uh, through time. Um, here you can see how these lake dwellings burned from time to time. Uh, they got preserved underwater and could then be excavated by the scientists. And another very interesting uh, tool that we were looking on very closely at the moment is augmented reality. And I'm showing you this example because I like it very much. It's, I don't know if has anyone been to this building. It's Graceland, the home of Elvis Presley. It's just a crazy scenography. Whenever you have the time to go to, to Memphis, you have to see it. Um, it's, this is the living room, but there are 20 more spaces, and every space is, is even crazier than the space before. And um, if you visit this space, there are tons of stories um, behind, that stories that you want to uh, learn, stories you want to hear. But of course, you can't imagine of uh, any explanation because it will immediately destroy the space. And uh, here, the, the people did something very clever. Um, the people were given a, a tablet. And this tablet just shows the exact environment. And you can see there are some hotspots. And if you press this button, you can listen to the music of Elvis. You can uh, learn about what he, has, what he did on the sofa. And, all the stories behind that space. So it's kind of an, a second layer, an overlay of the real space. So you still recognize the real space, but you get this information layer, this storytelling layer on this digital device. This is something which I think is very interesting, especially for original settings. And we did something um, with uh, augmented reality in this project uh, for the State Museum of Baden. Uh, in Karlsruhe, it's a prototype exhibition about their ancient history section. Um, and it's a project that we developed with the university and uh, at a, uh, our office um, in a joint cooperation. And what did we do here? So if you look at this, it's a, it's a very, very classic uh, museum presentation. So it's archaeological findings presented next to each other. Pot, again, yeah, similar objects are shown in comparison without any explanation. You know this from, from ancient um, museums, and it, it's not so common anymore, because now you want to try to give, tell a story and, and give a deeper meaning um, to, to these objects. And with um, VR, we can access these classical situations in a completely new way. So you see this kind of background. It's, it's not decoration, it's a code. And uh, this device reads the code and give, provides all the information about these objects uh, to the visitor. He can collect these objects, um, make, make his personal collection, and then put them on a, on a table and explore them. Um, get all the deeper meanings, compare them with other objects. So he can really work like a, like a scientist, like a collector in a completely new way um, of museum. And uh, here the museum is going even further. If um, you are interested uh, in, in one object in a very special way, you can ask this friendly guy and then he will get the object and you can touch it um, with your hands and started very visual, <laughs> became very digital, and in the end, it's becoming very physical again. And as I said, it's a prototype of a new museum. They're testing it at, at, at the moment. Of course, there are many people that are arguing against it. People are not allowed to touch it. What can happen to the objects? There are many, many th stories. Um, but I think it's... Um, it's a very interesting uh, concept, and if it works out, they're going to do all the rest um, of their museum in the same way. And it started um, with a research project at our university. So, um, yeah, this was my introduction to, to show you 
um, our way of working and the tools that we're working with. And now I want to introduce three projects a little closer, three very different projects um, that um, are developed in three different fields, um, culture, brand, and architecture. And I would like to start with culture, and I would like to introduce our largest uh, project that we're working on at the moment, the Grand Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Um, it was an international uh, competition. The architecture was won by a young um, Irish office, um, architectural office, Hennig and Peng. And we won the uh, exhibition part. This is what we are in charge for, the piazza, the atrium, um, the grand stairs, and the famous Tut and Amun galleries, which is now the heart of uh, this museum and the children's museum. And I don't know if you've been to Cairo and um, have visited the old museum, um, which has been replaced by this new building. This is how it looks, and it's a very, very classic uh, presentation. Um, you see the objects, there's not much um, context, there's not, not much storytelling, and exactly this is what um, we didn't want to do. We didn't want to do a, a, a presentation like, like this with no a context, um, an art museum without any explanation. But we wanted to, again, tell a story. Um, I'm explaining the Tutankhamun section to you now because it's the most important one. Um, so, of course, you want to know the story of Tutankhamun. You want to know the story behind this guy. And um, by telling his story, you learn about the funeral, about his lifestyle, and um, the whole Egyptian philosophy behind with the rebirth and so on. And, of course, you also want to know something about the discovery. Yeah, who found um, the grave? How did that happen? Why is it so well preserved? And so on. And um, so we did a, a, a spatial layout that, that works in, in two different ways. This is the Tutankhamun Gallery, one of these ribbons I just showed to you in the um, overview. Um, and it's a museum that has to work for 15,000 visitors per day. So it has a clear um, way of um, leading the visitor through the museum. And um, it's, a, it's a parkour that works in, in two ways. So you, you start here, you meet the young king, you learn about his death, then you witness the, his mummification and his funeral, um, experience his rebirth and, and belief, and then his afterlife, and in the end you, you find his, his tomb. So it's, it's one continuous storyline that you can follow um, through the exhibition. If you visit it the other way around, it also works. You start as a discoverer, as a scientist, you discover the tomb, you step into the antechamber, you explore the treasury, you unwrap the king, get closer to the man, and in the end, you find out who he was. So there are two ways um, you could um, read this story and learn about um, the, the king and um, the people found um, his grave. And there was a second real big challenge, because this is the space. So it's a daylit space. It's huge. It's like an airport. Um, and we had to present small objects, precious objects. And we wanted to tell this story in a space like this. So um, this, as I mentioned before, it's always the combination of the object um, and the space and the story you want to tell, that initiates your concept. And this is the concept that we uh, came up with. So basically we are, um, the design consists of two elements. It's one that is connected to the floor. It's the flow of life. So we're telling um, the story step by step. And then there's a second element which is very important, especially for the Egyptians, which is the afterlife, you know, because um, in, in, in ancient Egypt, basically the life was only a preparation for the afterlife. So it's, it's very, a very important part of, um, of the history, and it became these two design elements, and with these design elements, this is a very initial 
um, 3D sketch of it, we could narrow down this huge space and um, come up with a setting for the objects and also um, reduce the, this huge space to a smaller space to a space that can be um, experienced by the visitor. And of course you see we also dimmed down the light because we, we think that um, the objects that you want to present should always be um, the lightest pieces in space. So this is the path of life. and This is the afterlife, the path of the sun, which will be slightly in a slightly animated ceiling. And here you can almost see the storytelling. Yeah, you see the mummification of the king. Um, you see the tomb. And in the end, you see a beautiful mask, which is the highlight uh, object of the collection. Yeah. And with this combination, again, of location, the objects, and the storytelling, the design is created. If the space would be different, if the story would be different, then, of course, the design would be different. So there's this kind of very, very strong relationship. And this is what I mean when I'm talking about form follows content. And maybe you're also interested um, in the making. Um, for the first time, all 5,500 objects um, from the tomb are shown in the new museum. So this is the object list. And of course, you have to deal with every single object. You have to find a position for every object. It's a lot of work, um, but I'm showing this to you because it's not so complicated in the end. We start very simple. We cut out these single pieces. From foam board, um, there's a number, there's um, the explanation, it's the real size. And then we start working um, in plan models, very simple. This is the gallery, and we try out um, possible combinations of objects in, in real scale. And then it's getting becoming 3D, we start to fold things up, and it's getting becoming spatial. And then we start with very, very simple models, that become more and more sophisticated, and in the end it looks like this. Yeah? So there's a certain complexity, of course, but um, we're trying to break it down in, in easy, simple parts um, to handle it um, and to make it possible to even deal with such a big project. And in the end, of course, you have to draw all the showcases, and of course, in the end, there are more than 700 showcase plans to draw. It's a huge project. You have to do all the detail plans, and there are more than uh, 450 detail plans that you have to draw, and you have to do everything in BIM. This is something in all these international projects becoming more and more um, evident. So um, everything has to be modeled uh, in, in 3D in data fields. And we just had seven months for the planning. This is also something completely crazy. Um, with these uh, huge projects that you don't have time. And um, there's one presentation per month. So we had to fly to Egypt to present everything um, every month. And we had to do a submittal every month. So this is one submittal. Um, so it's actually crazy to do these, these projects. Um, and, but you can only do it with your um, amazing team. This is the team, 23 people, were just working on this single um, project. Um, they're coming from all over the world. And together with this great team, it was possible to manage the complexity in such a short amount of time. This is how it looks now. Um, we're about to open um, the first galleries by the end of the year. And I'm, I'm quite sure that it's um, worth going there. Yeah, second example I would like to show is a brand project. Um, so besides these cultural museum projects, we are also working for major brands. And um, one of the, the brands we're working for is Hyundai, um, a Korean car manufacturer. And I'm showing you this car. It's a Sonata from 2008. I don't know if, if any one of you is driving a Hyundai car. Um, they used to be very um, cheap cars, but 
kind of reliable. Um, but this is the car they presented one year ago. There's just 10 years between this car and this car. And what you can see is there's a huge um, development and there's a, also a completely different um, attitude to this brand from someone who's providing cheap cars to, to a company that has a, a completely different um, approach, that a company that thinks that design can attract uh, people and a company that wants to become one of the leading automobile companies um, of the world. And if you look at um, this change in, in perspective, um, this is, of course, something that you have to deal with when you um, are asked to develop a brand experience center. Um, this is a building from Delugan and Meissel, Austrian architects. And we were asked um, to develop all the interiors, the brand experience within um, this building close to um, Seoul in South Korea. And you probably know all these places where new cars are, are being displayed. You enter the building, you see new cars, all shiny and, and polished. And again, we started uh, to think about storytelling um, and started from this showcasing, from the from showcasing of new cars, and then had the idea to tell the story backwards. So from the new car to the production of the car, to the development of the car, um, to the design. So the design of the car, which is usually the initiating process, um, was kind of the highlight, um, um, the peak of um, the parkour for the visitor. And again, the space, kind of complex, you had to go up and down in this building. And again, it's, it's, it's this combination of storytelling and the spatial uh, setting and the object that leads to the design. And yeah, this is the, the first part. It's the plant area where the cars are being produced from, from uh, pressing uh, to welding to um, painting to the final assembly, and we worked with robots, so we used industrial robots that are used in the factories, and, and they are, as they are um, assembling the cars, they are painting the cars, and the visitors can interact with the robots, and they can, um, so basically this is a large uh, interactive installation where the visitor can interact with the, with the robots and learn about the manufacturing process. And um, when we did this, we were so fascinated by these robots and their behavior that we thought um, they, they almost act like humans. So we thought, why shouldn't they make a break from time to time and decide um, to dance? And this is what they did. Good, um, movie, so every half an hour. And they stop working, not um, dancing. Actually, this is something we didn't plan from the beginning. It just happened on the spot. 
Uh, it just happened one night. We sat there with the programmers, and we had this crazy idea. And the programmers said, yes, we do it. Uh, it was, of course, super fancy also for the programmers. Because usually they're doing programming robots for, uh, for, uh, for the factory, and now they had to um, develop a choreography. And um, why I'm telling this, this story? Because the, the, these are the things that can change brand perception. A large, uh, the largest automobile manufacturer, so people are not really in love with this company. Yeah, so they th think they are strong and uh, they are somehow um, reigning the market. And <coughs> these, these things where people can all of a sudden can smile, um, they, can, they can change um, the perception of the brand because all of a sudden it's something you can. Um, admire you, something you can look at um, and smile. Um, it's not so serious um, as, as the other side. <coughs> yeah, I'm not showing every um, space that we have designed, um, but it's it's always we always try to uh, unveil the unexpected, and this is uh, the safety area of. Um, um, this this premise, and we all know airbags, but usually they are hidden, and we never want to use them, of course. And uh, we thought, wh why don't we develop a space that is somehow um, embracing the visitor, so gi giving the this feeling, the sense um, of safety. And so these airbags became visible. They be they are becoming interactive. You can touch them. They are responding to the visitor. They are deflating and inflating, so basically they are acting um, the visitor um, in this performative installation. And yeah, it's a bigger picture um, showing the idea of safety um, in the car. And finally, um, the design area, um, the peak, the highlight of uh, the exhibition is a a space that, that is a combination of, of physical and digital elements. What you can see here is uh, 720 um, aluminum poles that can move up and down, um, a media wall and a light and sound setting. And here, again, another story is being told, the story of Hyundai's design, which is developed um, from, nat from natural forms that are then being transformed into the shape Ah, and the p visitor can see this in a short show, and I will show you a short movie clip to give an, get you an idea about this combination of different um, elements that create an atmospheric space of choice for the Hyundai visitor. <laughs> So this is kind of the, the company he addresses uh, to, to their clients in a very impressive way. Um, but we 
again want to do, to do something else. There's a, second, there's a second mode of this installation. So while people enter and exit the space, they can interact with this stuff. So it's becoming something tangible, something touchable, um, something that re reacts to them. So it's again showing a different attitude of the company to their customers. And I think we always try to to look at both sides. Of course, it's some, sometimes you have to impress, sometimes you have to overwhelm, but on the other hand, you always have to um, show a different um, perspective, something that is more open and um, changing the brand perspective. Yeah, and of course, if you do some things like this, I, I'd like to show you this from the factory. Um, <coughs> To do installations like this is, of course, something very complex. You start with one single pole, you develop it, you test it, and then you add more and more to it. And if you have an idea how to do it, um, then you set up the whole thing in the factory. And, and the end, all, all this lower part is hidden in the floor, and you can only see uh, the upper part. Um, of the installation. And of course, there are many things you have to look at, this maintenance, what happens if this hole in the center is, is breaks and you have to replace it, how you get all these things done. There's a lot of things to, to take care of with these complex installations. Um, we did it with a Korean company. They um, did it with a lot of uh, passion and um, good attitude to it in an enormous precision and it's really Impressive if you see it moving because it's 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 not a film it's uh, it's not something digital it's it's really a moving object uh, and we we tried it out and um, first we had a part of the scene where all the the poles are going moving up and then going down all together and then the building was shaking and it was really um, we had to change the choreography because it was just not possible. So it's, it's, a, it's also moving um, masses, it's moving, it has a lot of energy and you can feel um, this energy when you look at this installation. This is probably um, why it is so strong if you feel it um, when you visit the space. So whenever you have time, I think it's worth seeing and putting uh, outside. So, yeah. Third project um, I want to show is about architecture, because all the things that I told you before um, also apply um, to architecture. So architecture is also about uh, storytelling um, and about recontextualizing uh, spaces. And um, we, this, what you see here is the former maintenance hall of the German railway. Um, it was abandoned, um, and later it was um, yeah, somehow conquered by artists illegally. They used the space for their installations, um, they were uh, parties and, and events, and it became a very, very popular space in Stuttgart. And usually the idea was to tear this building down, uh, for, to build new apartments, but since it became so popular, the city decided to keep this space as a cultural hotspot for Stuttgart. And um, we won this competition um, and were asked to remodel it, but to keep everything as it is. And um, yeah, we, this is the, the floor plan of, of the premise. And uh, when we get a job like this, we, we always try to find out as much as possible about the history um, of the building. So we go into the archives, we look at the old drawings, and um, to understand the story um, of the building. And this is the original plan of, um, of this maintenance hall. You can see the tracks um, that are not existing anymore. Um, they're going in and out. And then here is a, a kind of moving um, platform. Um, that could distribute the, the trains into um, these different workshops where the trains um, were being repaired. So there's a special structure 
um, of this building, a special way this building was designed and functioned for many years. Um, so we looked at this floor plan again and then we overlaid it with the uh, old plans we found and we, we saw that this building somehow was still existing, even if it has been uh, changed over time and not everything is still existing. And so during, with this overlay, we came up uh, with a design um, for, for the new building or for the renovation. And you can see here, we left this, this central space open. So the space where this moving platform was um, <coughs> distributing um, the trains is open, becoming the open space. And here, these are the different ateliers of the artists. And they can move in and out like um, the trains did before. So the, the history of the building became um, the idea for, for the new design. And of course, we had to keep everything as it was. So this is the building after it opened. Um, it is now again a place for, um, for parties and, and, and concerts. Um, of course, we had to add some elements um, to make it um, secure and safe and according to um, the building laws. But it looks almost as it um, looked before. This is the renovated facade. So you see we left all the traces of, of, of history, all the different stories that are embedded in this building um, to make it a visible, a readable building with many stories of the different um, times of the usage of the building. And this is the northern uh, part of um, the building where uh, in the 50s and 60s of the last um, century many things were added. And we carefully looked at all these buildings and I'm changing the image now to the new situation. You can look at this part of the building. It looks like a shabby one-story building. And this is how it looks now. Yeah, this is the shabby one-story part of the building. So you see it, it, it is still a remaining part of, of the old building. We took away this building here in front to make the old um, entrance visible and created this new city plaza, which is an entrance to uh, the area of the artist and uh, to a dance school that is located in this part of the building. And what has been gone, the upper part of, of this building has been um, remodeled and replaced, but of course in a different way that you can see that it's been added just recently. And again, it's about um, the, the story um, of the building. Um, and in this case, the building itself is the object that we are putting um, on display and um, the story that is becoming visi visible for the um, visitor of these events that are taking place in this building. So you can see that these, these principles that I introduced at the beginning of my lecture are being applied um, on every uh, project, even if they look completely different and even if the tasks um, even if it's architecture, if it's a renovation project, if it's a museum or a brand project. And this is um, our strong um, belief, this is our intention. All the projects are different, but the attitude uh, towards <laughs> is the same. And this is actually what I'm also uh, trying in my uh, teaching at the university. And um, I'm finishing this, uh, this lecture today um, with some student projects I would like to show um, to give you an idea what we are doing at, uh, at Constance. Constance is a relatively small city. We are having 100,000 inhabitants, but we're having two universities, um, so um, about 15,000 students. So the, there are many students in this uh, city, so it's a very lively city located at the <coughs> Lake of Constance at the border to Switzerland. And yeah, we're doing very different uh, projects and um, we, um, I would like to introduce some of our spatial innovations 
This is a, pr a project that we did this summer uh, in Switzerland um, together with um, universities from Switzerland. It was an outdoor exhibition in um, the so-called Limmatal. It's the, the suburbs of Zurich, um, which is the biggest city of of Switzerland, and of course, it's as you know, Switzerland is, is, is a very rich country, and um, the land is super expensive. And so, this project it's called Limopoli, referring to the famous game Monopoly, um, is has changed this parking lot into um, a Monopoly field, and um, of course, is is referring to the high um, prices of. It's a photograph, it's not a montage, so this project really has been built. Um, another project, this group collected stories from the people from the valley. Um, there are all kinds of different um, people living there, and um, with everyone with their individual story, and uh, usually they are kept secret, and the students unveiled these stories and put them um, into this uh, landscape um, installation in a very beautiful way. And this is also a project I like very much. Um, it's at the border of three different um, communities. And um, for me, hard to believe. I thought uh, Switzerland is a peaceful country, but it's not. Um, because these three communities, they hate each other. And um, the people, they really fight against each other. Um, people are getting hurt, and so the student groups, uh, the group of students <coughs> thought, why don't we let them play against each other, or with each other, so on a triangular uh, plot, they came up with this idea of a soccer field with three goals, where three different um, communities could play with each other instead of fighting each other. So a very simple uh, public landscape area, but I think very successful. Yeah, and um, at our university, we are strongly focusing um, on interdisciplinary projects. So um, <coughs> at my university, the University of Applied Sciences, I'm responsible for architecture and design, bringing architects and designers together in projects. And um, since a couple of years, I have a cooperation with the second university of Constance and um, departments of history and computer science. And together with these four disciplines, we, we have set up a study course um, of four semesters. And um, it starts um, with the first year, which is a very theoretical year, history of collecting and storytelling through objects. This is the theoretical background of the project of um, um, ex exhibition design. And then we start with a theory of media-based exhibition design. And then in a the second year, um, we do a concept and we realize an exhibition that we set up uh, in the city um, of Constance. And we do this <coughs> together with these four uh, disciplines. And so um, people can learn from each other. Um, and with the historians, we have somehow future curators and architects and designers um, that can be the designers and, um, of uh, these, these spaces. And with computer scientists, we are also able to develop complex um, digital installations within these exhibitions. And I would like to show you the exhibition that we did um, two years ago. It's about uh, Palmyra. I don't know if you know the city of Pal Palmyra. It's in Syria. It was, has been destroyed uh, by Islamic State. And um, the exhibition focused this, um, this question, what should happen with this destroyed world heritage, should we rebuild it, and um, if so, in which way. Um, yeah, I show a sh short movie for those who do not know 
Ähm, Palmyra. UNESCO Welterbe. Palmyra. Palmyra. So being destroyed by Islamic State. Destroyed by ISIS. Palmyra. Palmyra. The ancient city of Palmyra. Palmyra, die wohl schönste antike Stätte Syriens, wird zum traurigen Beispiel für bedrohtes Weltkulturerbe. It's in German, but to give die Terroristen des Daesh zerstörten in den letzten Jahren die ehemals prunkvollen Tempel, Turmgräber und Säulenstraßen. Bis zu ihrer Sprengung berichteten die Bauwerke von der Hochzeit der Oase. Palmyra war ein bedeutender Handelsplatz zwischen Indien, Mesopotamien und dem Mittelmeer. Wie gehen wir mit der Zerstörung des kulturellen Welterbes um? Und wie können wir Geschichte erleben, wenn das Original nicht mehr vorhanden ist? Diese Fragen stellt die Ausstellung Rebuild Palmyra im Bildungsturm Konstanz. Is this Konstanz? This is the, the building we get from the city. Um, it's a four-story building, um, historic um, part that has been expanded. And um, during summer we, we can set up this exhibition here. And again, um, we always start with a story, with a storytelling. Um, so in this four-story building, we start with the current events on the uh, ground floor. Then we introduce the history of Palmyra. We of course we have to understand um, the meaning um, of, of the city. Then we learn about the destruction. And in the end, the question is raised, how should it be reconstructed? And we can quickly go through the exhibition. This is the ground floor um, where the visitor is, is, can read articles in the newspapers. This is basically um, everything that he should know already if he reads the news. Um, then one level up, um, this is the history of the city. So there's a timeline where you can learn everything about um, the growth and, and the decline of, of the city. Um, and then there are two major installations. Um, this one is an interactive map and it's showing the goods that have been traded at that uh, time, the trading routes. And you here can see Palm Palmyra is at the intersection of many trading routes. This is why the city um, was so successful and became so um, uh, prominent. And uh, so we have learned this. And then you learn about um, the development of, of the city. Um, there's an interactive uh, installation, a time slider. You see how the city was constantly growing. You learn about um, the major buildings. And then on the next level, where you, you are somehow on the surface of this cable I just showed to you, you are in Palmyra. Um, so you walk through the city and you have these tables where the uh, most important buildings are being displayed. They are shown in their current status, destructed. Um, so these are uh, 3D models that the students have been um, reconstructed from drawings. And you, then you can explore uh, these 3D models with augmented reality. And uh, you can <coughs> see the different stages the current status, the historic status, um, before and after destruction. And again, you see the code from the pro project I showed you before. So this was basically the project where this technology was um, first developed and applied later on a commercial project for a museum. The uh, VR glasses um, that allow you to travel at the luck um, to get these beautiful 360 degree um, photographs um, before the destruction. So you could travel to Palmyra. We talked about means of reconstructing art that is lost. And in the end, the visitor has to make a decision. Should we rebuild Palmyra? Yes or no? Simple question. And there were two doors, and um, the, the people were triggered and counted, and the results were given uh, at the exit. And of course, to build something like Palmyra after destruction is not so simple. And this is the last space where the visitor could make lots of yes and no decisions um, to come to a more refined answer 
of this question. And in the end, there were five possible answered answers um, from leave it as it is, as a as ruins, as a um, memory for future generations, or rebuild it even more beautifully as it was before. And um, it was very interesting how the perspective um, of the visitors, visitors changed. In the, in the beginning, um, almost everyone said, yes, we have to rebuild it, 80%. But in the end, um, yeah, many visitors found it even more in the middle. But this is what we actually intended to do. Um, that the visitor could make up his, his mind and come to a personal uh, conclusion um, him by himself. And then you could vote, um, give your personal opinion, and this is what I to told you. 80% um, um, voted yes. This is the installation that was displayed at the entrance. And of course, um, there's a marketing um, campaign that the students had to develop, um, very controversial, of course. And um, we, we, there's no, no budget, there's no, no money, so the students built everything on their own. Um, they, it's also their job to, to get sponsors. Um, and um, it's, it's always amazing what is possible um, with this beautiful and great group um, of students that we're having every three years. And of course, they're giving guided tours, so in the end they also show their, their work to the uh, people, to the visitors of, of Constance. And um, yeah, th this exhibition had a large media recognition. Uh, we had German TV and radio reports, and even Al Jazeera um, reported um, with their TV from the exhibition. So it was a great um, success also for the students. And I think what's important uh, with, within these projects is that you learn um, not only to, uh, to design something, but also to collaborate with, with other um, disciplines. And um, this is something that I think is, is very important also during your studies, because in the end, <coughs> Uh, when you work in, in uh, offices like our office, you have to collab collaborate with many different uh, people um, in order to be able to create these complex uh, projects. And I think this is something you should um, also learn during your studies. Okay, so um, this is my uh, insight in, in our work that we're doing at the office and our student um, uh, projects. And um, thank you very much uh, for your interest. And um, I'm happy for any discussion, um, any of your uh, questions.
Yeah. So that we're not in that yeah. I think it, it's a very relevant question um, <clears throat> because um, as, an, as a designer, of course, you are not the expert about <laughs> all these stories that you have to tell in space in your exhibition. So um, this is why I think it's, it's really um, important, and this is what we're trying to do at, at, at our university, that you learn how to, um, how to deal, how to in interact um, with, uh, with the expert, with the scientist, with the archaeologist. And um, of course, it's, it's, always, it's always a back and forth. It's, it's like a ping pong. Yeah? Um, you come up with an... First you listen to them, you try to understand it, you try to get at least become a little expert. I think everyone has to become a little expert, otherwise <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, and then you come up with a design and, and you present it to the curators and then there's a discussion and, and it's a back and forth. And, and, and usually it's, it's not the, the, the idea, your first idea that is being built. But it's, um, it's a combination of ideas that um, also is being developed during these discussions. And, um, but I think it's important to understand each other and also especially to understand the different way of thinking. And um, this is really what I like the most about these student projects. Um, when, an, when an historian uh, talks with a designer, um, things happen. <coughs> And they learn about different ways of thinking, um, about uh, different ways of developing um, ideas, and it's also about different speeds. Yeah, sometimes the designers are super fast, whereas the historians, they have to do research uh, for a long, long time. And, and there are many things that you have to be aware of when you work together. And um, I think it's never um, too early to start with that. Hopefully, right? <laughs> Hopefully, this is the reason, yeah? Um. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for listening.